So let's kind of start this thing. I mean, um, cause I, I kind of want to, you know, it's good to connect with you again and, 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 but I'd really yeah, like to share, you. um, you know, a little bit of your story with some of my students and, and people that might view in, uh, on this, they're not going to view in right now. This will probably be a, um, it's a pre-recorded that I'm going to send it out. But, um, you know, I thought it'd be good just to kind of start off and just kind of start from the beginning, but I think I'm going to start introducing you and, and start what, what happened this year and then kind of work where that came from, you know, because I think, uh, you know, and this is just you and I just spitballing here, you know, I think what's kind yeah. of interesting to me is that, at, you know, roughly 60 years old, you, you were playing some pretty good golf and, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty darn well golf scores. And, uh, you know, a lot of people want to know, how do you do that? And then also, you know, you come at the, you, you come at the game sort of uh, in a different way that's not readily, that's more actually for the average person may be actually more read, readily available um, if they have the discipline and the knowledge than not having the genetic ability to swing a club 120 miles an hour, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, you've, mm -hmm. you've managed your game for, for decades now. Um, and, and, and you would think that you'd be increasingly maybe less relevant, but your golf scores don't really indicate that. So, you know, contrary to this data that we constantly get or bombarded with, you know, and you and I both know that the USGA limits how fast that ball can come on the club face. Yeah. But, you know, everybody talks about more and more distance. And we realize, too, that it is a big advantage uh, at the higher levels. But in spite of that, you've been continued to play well. So that's kind of where I want to come at this thing and, and, mm -hmm. and kind, of, kind of draw it somewhere to there. But your story is also interesting. Uh, and, and I think, um, you know, that's what I also want to get out. Plus, I want to portray you as a, someone that's available to somebody if they want to take their game to the next level at this stage of their life. Mm -hmm. If they're a junior or an adult that wants to, and they live in the San Diego or want to travel down and see Jeff Hart, I'd love to have them do that too. So I'm going to start off and just say, welcome Jeff Hart. Uh, Jeff Hart, PGA professional. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks John or Grundy as I've known you for how yeah, many decades go back. now. <laughs> Jeff, yeah. You know, it, it's, um, I was pondering this first meeting. I think it was uh, at Indian Hills. Could have been, yeah. We lived on the seventh tee. Uh, moved there when I was seven, or family moved there when we were seven years. Or I was seven years old, and right. I, I think was a, a, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, the seventh tee was my backyard, and initially when we moved there, I have uh, six brothers and sisters. We used the golf course for football and baseball, and we didn't know what this thing golf was really at that point. My yeah. dad played, and he eventually got us all playing golf. So, what age was uh, that for you? Uh, what age was that me? for you? When you for, what age was I, that I, for I you? I was seven you years old. Okay. Yeah, seven years old when I started, and seven years old when we moved on to the golf course there at Indian Hills. Okay. And I took to the game and, and uh, loved it, you know, right off the bat, I guess you could say, and, and liked practicing, liked everything about it, and – our back door of the house and we had kind of a small backyard and then a slope of grass that went right down to the seventh tee and i liked the fact that i could just go do it i didn't need anybody else like we did with baseball and basketball and football exactly. you had to gather up the whole yep. neighborhood to get a game going this thing i could do on my own there was no fence between our backyard and the seventh tee, so you just walked out onto the tee, yeah. and there you were. And you could look up the sixth hole and see if someone was coming, and if no one was coming, you're out there playing. And yeah. uh, it was an ideal place for a kid to grow up, and especially an aspiring golf pro to grow up. Right, so. exactly. And, and uh, you know, we might add a, a, a sort of a, a – nutrient rich environment that both of us grew up in i was going to mention the first time i met you you were 14 years old i think and i was kind of a little bit of a late bloomer to golf as far as tournaments i i played baseball and football primarily up until about the age of like 13 or 14 and uh, my freshman year in high school got talked into going playing golf with a buddy who you may remember this junior a kid named matt Morita. Um, anyway, he, he had won a lot of trophies as a junior and, 
And so he, he invites me out and, and he goes, Hey, you can play varsity golf. So a couple of years later, I, I get him up my first playoff and it's at Indian Hills and you're playing for first and second. And this is an illuminating story about you. And this is why I'm telling this. Not only it's where we met on my first time at be meeting you. I wasn't often paired in the leader groups at junior events. So I get to play with you in this playoff because you're playing for first and second at any rate. Uh, during this playoff, you hold a six iron on your second shot. I was standing about 10 feet away from you. And as I recall, I think you either, I think you hold it or it was a kick in, but I think it was a hold six iron uh, to win. Are you sure win. that wasn't Lakewood? Maybe it was sure Lakewood. that wasn't Lakewood? <laughs> was it Lakewood? Was I remember it doing it at Lakewood. I don't remember doing it in Indian Hill. Maybe it was Lakewood then. Maybe I got it, it wrong. Lakewood. But you hold the six iron, and and, I'm, I, and you kind of slid the back club into the bag and walked back to the clubhouse, <laughs> and your opponent hadn't even hit yet. So you, you, there was really not much emo, emotion out of you. You just made the shot and kind of walked away. So, um, so, you know, and that is sort of your style of play. You've always been really good at that. But, again, we, we grew up in this nutrient-rich junior, and I want to kind of focus on that area is, mm -hmm. you know, talk, let's talk about some of the juniors in the 60s and the 70s before we get to college uh, that you played with. I mean, just, just name a few of them. Well, at, at, at Indian Hills, uh, someone I played, you know, daily with was Brett Mullen, who went yeah. on to win the U.S. junior. Brett was two years older than – than I am. Brett Brett went to SC like I did, and uh -huh. uh, we played a lot of golf at Indian Hills. And there were half a dozen others in addition to my two older brothers, Mark and Terry. We played a lot of golf as kids, and yep. that's all we did. You know, yep. back then, if you weren't playing another sport or riding your bike around, you were playing golf. And and we were lucky that we were on a course, Indian Hills, that. Uh, allowed us to do that you know and right. that is the key access is always the key isn't it access is the key yeah and yeah. and we and you know like i said we could we had a thing we played number seven and then the second tee box was right next to the seventh green so we'd go play seven we'd cut over to two play, play two three four five and six so we'd play six holes in an hour and you yeah, know yeah. just like warming up uh, shooting baskets or something for us. We just did it to kill an hour before the Flintstones came on at three o'clock sure. or something. So, yeah, and that's and that that you know that that sort of repetition is sort of significant of something that you do well on a golf course is is, is repetition. Um, I'm going to flash forward right now, and part of the mm -hmm. reason why we're doing this is um, in Southern California. You're a member of the PGA. You're a member of the section down there, lifetime mm -hmm. member. And uh, this year, you won both the section championship and the senior championship at, at what age, 59 or 60, or were you 60? I was 59 yet, uh, or then. I'll be 60 one week from today. Well, happy birthday. As a matter of fact, yeah. Mr. Hart, you, you and my wife have the same birthday. Cinco de Mayo. Well, it says May 9th, it says May 9th in the PGA uh, – uh, well, they're off. I'm Cinco de Mayo. Oh, you're Cinco de Mayo. Oh, she's One May 9th. Today, yeah. better, better call the uh, Miss Brett. Yeah. Better, uh, yeah, better call the editor. Better call down to the yeah. office of Pot of Vedra and straighten them out. Yeah. Uh, they, anyway, so, yeah, so happy birthday. Happy early birthday. So, Thanks. but even at the ripe age of 59, you know, the, the, that's, that's quite a feat. I mean, there's, you know, a few thousand members of the PGA in Southern California and quite, quite a host of good players. But not only did you win the event, you shot some pretty low scores to do it. I think at, at the senior event at Oak Valley, did you go 64, 64, I think? Which I did. 128. I did. Um, yeah. I've played that golf course. Mm -hmm. 128 is really good. So congratulations on that. And then uh, you followed that up with the victory at Alice Hall, the ranch course, shooting averaging uh, roughly 65.3 for three rounds, I think, which is another – and won in a playoff there. Tell me a little bit about those tournaments. What was going on with your game at the uh, this fall? Was there any change in your game? I mean, normally you play pretty well, but again, you're averaging right around sixty four point nine for six rounds. <laughs> well, two things. Yeah. Without sounding too falsely humble, both courses were short. Okay. And that's well, okay. a prerequisite for me shooting good scores these days, since I'm averaging about 250 off the tee on a good exactly day. right you are averaging 250 yeah. my friend <laughs> so luckily for me they they held 
both tournaments on relatively short courses and as they should for the senior event because yeah at an advanced stage you lose some distance as i have and most of yeah. us have uh you lose club head speed specifically i think you lose your turn and range of motion my thoracic spine just feels locked up and i look at it and i say can you please turn a little more and i just can't so it there's no speed generated when you don't generate speed you are not going to hit the ball very far so. but, but jeff i love you man because this is what you always do you you are you are like you got you you self you're so self-deprecating and your record does not indicate the deprecation my friend i love it about you but i'm well, sorry i mean if, if i start reading off what you've accomplished at golf in your 40 years of tournaments i mean we, we have about 20 pages we could go through uh i mean let's just start junior golf uh you played at how many cup match teams right you played on most of them once you were about 15 uh, you were always the top five yeah. point winner in junior golf every year. I mean, that's pretty much true. And, and we're talking guys, I mean, the host of players that played junior golf that you played with, I played on the PGA Tour. I mean, of our, of our group, there are major winners like Corey Pavin and Craig Stadler a few years ahead of you, Scott Simpson, San Diego guys from now mm -hmm. where you live in San Diego. Yeah. Um, there are a massive amount of tour players. Lenny Clements, another player that comes to mind. Um, we could just go through the list. Yeah. Um, but you competed against a lot of them in, in junior golf and college golf. And that's what I'd like to switch to real quick. How did you transition from junior golf to college golf? You went to the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, USC, and uh, which has a great tradition in golf. Um, and uh, you, you followed that. Can you talk to me about that transition and some of the teammates that you played with a little bit? Yeah, it, it wasn't... Uh as smooth as I expected, you know, from my senior year high school to freshman year, I don't think I played particularly well that freshman year. You know, I played on the team, of course, and, mm -hmm. uh, but progressively it got better and made third team all American my junior year and first team Your last year, my senior year. But as was typical of me, I wasn't just bursting with confidence like most guys would after they, you know, made first team all America. Where's the pros? I'm ready to go at them. I, I wasn't in that frame of mind at all. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I went back for a fifth year and got my degree. Uh, yeah. Good for you. Specifically because I thought I may need that uh, piece of paper someday, you know, if this golf thing doesn't work out. And I, and I did. I got my degree. And well, so what would you have done if golf hadn't worked out, Jeff? Because you got a degree in physical education, I saw, unless the PGA's got that wrong. No, you think got, about becoming a teacher right. or something? I, there was no real plan B, John, uh, yeah. which is why I'm still doing it. If there was a plan B, I would have been on to it long <laughs> well, ago. You but... are a survivor, my friend. That's for sure. Yeah, so. Yeah. So, so, so this transition wasn't that smooth, but you, you gradually kind of – uh, it, was there anything that changed in your game, or was it more physical or mental, uh, or with a little bit of a combo from freshman year? I, I think to becoming combo, an all Yeah, there's a combo, you know, of, of that. I worked with Ernie Vosser for a number of years, and he told me when he first saw my swing, he said, "You, you know, you've got some work to do." And I had a very upright, almost Matt Wolf-like backswing at that time, and he he wanted it, you know platter of course mm -hmm. and and it did get somewhat but it's still in there with me I still have kind of an upright uh, backswing to some degree and it, it changing you know the grip and the swing plane the stance everything it took mm -hmm. time and it was never really comfortable for me and uh, and you know I worked with a host of teachers along the way Ernie was probably Ernie and Ben Doyle were probably the most influential although later on my Champions Tour career, I worked with uh, Fred Shoemaker, and Fred did extraordinary a, golf. Really right. good for me, yeah, yeah. Fred's a fantastic teacher, and so you dropped a name, Ernie Vossler, a lot to a lot of people. They may not know who Ernie was, but Ernie was one of the founders of uh, Landmark Land Company, he was. Um, along with Ernie and Joe, uh, Joe, Joe Walzer. Uh, Joe Walzer. Yeah, uh, his sons Jeff and Stephen played. Oklahoma and Oklahoma State progressed. Jeff played for Oklahoma State. I think Steve played for Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. But they're both Oklahoma guys and, and an Oklahoma-based company. How did that connection come up with Ernie Vossler from not too far? I mean, you're in Riverside County, right? You're going up in Riverside. And so yeah. 
It's just yeah. a hop. It's an hour drive right out to La Quinta. Is that where you saw most of his lessons? or was That's it where I took uh, all of them. Initially, we uh, worked at La Quinta Country Club and because at that time, La Quinta Hotel and PJ West, none of those were built. In fact, yeah. I think we first worked at Del Safari. Oh, okay. Uh, with Ernie and I. And the way we hooked up was my father was in the furniture business. He knew a man named Bud Hersberg, who was a very good friend of Ernie. And Bud took a following in my junior career at that time. And I, I wasn't playing good, I think, in junior golf. He says, come on, we'll go see Ernie tomorrow or something. I, I'll call yeah. him tonight. And I knew the name, uh, yeah. Ernie Vosser. So, and I'd never taken any lessons to that point. I was about 13, 14 years old, maybe. You know, just sort of self-taught. My dad, yeah. maybe the – pro at the club might say something and you know I hit a lot of golf balls so I was more or less doing all the wrong things and grooving them and Ernie came <laughs> along and said we got to get some of this stuff out there and it was hard it was a lot of work and it uh, was frustrating because uh, we didn't really have video back then right, right, uh, right, like right. we do today and all the in fact uh, Ernie one of the Few, first few lessons he gave me, he says, asked my dad if we had a movie camera, which we did. And he said, if he could take a look at his swing and see it, he would change it a lot quicker. And sure enough, we got it out. And I did look at my swing. I had no idea my swing looked like that. He was telling me to do this and that. And I said, I'm not doing what he's saying. And then I looked at it. And sure enough, I was doing what he was saying I was doing. And I did change things a lot quicker because of the video, so. Yeah, Ernie was just for the people that might listen in, was, was a bit of a legend in the game of golf. He was a tremendous golfer. Most, I don't know if people really know that about Mr. Bossler, but he okay. had a tremendous, he was in regionally yeah. in the Oklahoma area. I don't know if he ever won a tour event. Did he win a tour he event? He won, I think, five times. On he tour. won five times, see, that, yeah. there you go. So yeah, I mean, that's, isn't that interesting today, um, except, You've won two PGA Tour events, but it's pretty hard to get a no, lesson. I've won with a, zero PGA Tour. Well, you won. I mean, we've won a corn. I mean, let's face it. You won on the corn ferry. Yeah. Okay. And one on the corn ferry tour. Yeah. No, uh, big, and big you, difference. That's like uh, the, uh, yeah, pitching but, a perfect game in the Triple A ball or one in the majors. If you yeah. Ask me. I, I, I don't know corn ferry. I mean, it, you know, you the scores are pretty low out there, Jeff. Uh, they're, it's oh, pretty they're competitive. Uh, yeah. we're, we're beginning to see, but me to say. Ernie Vosser was a tremendous asset for you. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, I mean, you have a lot of the experience. If, if I was a young man and I needed to go take lessons and I lived in San Diego, I would, the first, you know, I went down and saw Phil down in the old days, Phil Rogers, mm -hmm. when I was a young man, I, I, yeah. I, I certainly would go see Jeff Hart. And that was fortuitous for you because I think there's myself personally, I, I, uh, Eddie Marins was a game changer for me because of his knowledge and background of playing the game. And that's, and that's one of the assets that you really bring as a player is, is these early struggles really paid off for you because it, 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 it seems to that here 40 years later, 45, 50 years later, you have this stick to itiveness, this ability to, to know what works and what doesn't and uh, to know your game, you know? And so now you've worked, you've gone on to college, you've, you've, you've become an All-American, now you turn pro, it's 1983, am I correct on yeah, that? Okay, so you go to a tour school. What happens now, Mr. Hart? Well, I missed the first year. Back then they have two sort of regional sites to go to the right. final. I missed both of them. That's eight, end of 83. Mm -hmm. So I go to Asia, play the Asian tour in 84. And then at the end of 84, I get through Q school down at, I think it was La Quinta and uh, right. Mission Hills, I believe. Yeah, right. Mission Hills. I was there at the Dunes Court, Mission Hills, Dunes. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the wind blowout? Were you were there for the wind blowout day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. First round, yeah. First round. Yeah. I was at Mission Hill. I'm like, even was, after five, I, I, I was at the Dunes it. Course. I was at the yeah. discourse. The wind blew about a hundred miles an hour. You couldn't see the third green in the par three. You couldn't see. You couldn't the green. get it over the water on. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's for sure. If he made a, a legendary like fifteen, I think, yeah. <laughs> and then came back the next day with no win and made twelve. It still shot seventy five. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So that was nineteen eighty four. Okay, yeah. and so you're there, and you get a, you get you get through there. Which, by the way, I don't know if people. 
it would be interesting to go back and look at that field because there's quite a few players that really had great careers that came out of that tour school that year. Yeah. Azinger's one that comes to mind, and um, uh, Jeff Sluman's another one that comes to mind. Uh, Weavey, I think. Who? Uh, Mark Weavey, I believe. Mark Weavey, you know, yeah. School or several uh, there, others, yeah. Like there, was a, there was a lot of them, yeah. But yeah. Uh, So you get a card in 84. Now, uh, for the 85 season, yeah. 85 season, and you're on the regular tour? Yeah. yeah. Okay. They, they, there was no... Uh, there was no different, yeah. No, well, there was no Hogan tour, Nike tour, nothing then. You either got your card or you were back playing local mini tours. Or, or whatever. Okay, so 84, eight, you're out on the tour. What was that first year on tour like? And you've, now tra- you've been playing uh, you've over crazy. in Asia a couple of years, right? I went to Asia one year. One year. I played okay. pretty good there. You know, played, I think I finished 10th or 9th on the order of merit that year. So that was a Quite good year. Significant. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but I did not play well in 85. And, and I didn't even go, I knew I needed some more work. So I didn't go to Q school. I went to the European Q school. Okay. At the end of 85, and I got through it, but I just barely got, I got like, I think the last card in a playoff. Wow. So, uh, you know, being that far down the uh, pecking order, I only got in three tournaments in Europe the whole year. And I played a little bit in Sweden in between some events. They had a nice Swedish tour that was huh? kind of fun. And, and Were there with Jesper? Were you there with Jesper? <laughs> no, I don't remember him. Uh, I don't know if he was on the scene yet. I think he's a little bit younger than yeah, that's right. he and you. Yeah, but uh, it was fun. They had some good players. And I spent probably five weeks in Sweden, played four or five tournaments, and had a good good time. And and then uh, I think I went again in 86. I don't remember. I know I missed because I think the next time I had my card was 88 or 89. Right. So I missed there a couple of years. But you went a buy.com event in 88. The Sanderson, was that the no, Sanderson? No, no. I won. I finished fourth at... Hattiesburg, which used to be opposite the Masters, but oh, it was on the right. P- PJ Tour. The deposit guarantee class. Yeah. In fact, I Monday qualified for that and finished fourth. So that was a good good tournament for me. But I think it was 89 again before I got back on tour. And I've been to the tour school a hundred times. I mean, I lost. Well, you actually that. hold the record, by the way, I think, for the most times. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. It's not a record I, I want to hold. Third, so I, I, don't, think uh, I think it's either... 13 i wrote it down somewhere i think it's either the 13 i think it's 13 times for regular oh, it's, it's more than that 16, 16. it's count. 16 it's 16 then it's 16 if you count uh oh. champions tour Q oh my god yeah another six or seven of those i've been yeah, doing yeah. more you know so i like tour school that's that's my well, home you are life I, home. I have a little story i'd like to share at some point in this interview about tour school you actually had a little summation for me one day at dinner while we were sitting at the brigantine overlooking yeah. the racetrack at del mar with uh with randy yeah, peterson and uh you had a little theory that was a little different than most people would view tour school which is quite fascinating okay so you get through you you, you have a you, hattiesburg you get back on tour again and what happens now? As your game, what's going on with your golf game at this point? Is there anything changing about your game or anything that not, you're not enough? It's it's not getting better. It's stagnated, and everybody else is getting better, and I'm staying kind of the same. I guess <laughs> I never laid a glove on it on tour. I played seven years and never sniffed the even the 125. I was just kind of out there treading water. It it you know wasn't just that I hit the ball short Mm -hmm. uh I wasn't a good iron player I think you need to to me people say well you got to be a great putter out there or great short game to me you have to be a great iron player because in different conditions wind rain cold if you're a good iron player you can play if you're not a solid iron striker of the ball if you don't put a lot of spin on it, if you don't compress it, you're going to have trouble when the wind blows and when it gets cold and rainy and you've got 
layers right. of rain suits on and you can't move and you know that kind of thing to me well, what the, i've noticed in the, yep. in the champions that i've observed they're all great iron players you can look at mickelson I'm, i mean it's yep. not very many high percentage of his fairways off the tee but he's a wonderful iron player right. great short game I, I think you can get away with especially today not being uh all that accurate but you can't get away with being a poor iron player and well the stats do prove that I, you know um the recent statistician book that kind of broke the code on golf basically said that that the guy that wins each week from 110 to 190 um has usually the highest dispersion or the smallest dispersion to the pin that week so mm -hmm. we all think that it's the best putter yeah. Um, and, and that is a common denominator, strong putting. Uh, people don't realize how good. I mean, you basically averaged 1.7 per green. Uh, 1.73, I think, is your lifetime average as far as PGA Tour stats go, which, you know, is pretty darn good. I mean, if we do the math, uh, 1.7 1, 1. times 18, I think you're going to come right around 28.45 putts, somewhere in that frame, I would guess. Uh, per ground, 29. Uh, you would know better than I would. Uh, yeah, so, so that's where you are, Jeff. But okay. but you're right about the iron play. You, you know, getting that ball close is really, people, uh, you know, is kind of an overlooked stat, um, you know, and, and uh, that's really important. So I'm going to relay the story. We're sitting at the Brigantine, and it's right before tour school, and you, like you said, I'm, I'm a world-class tour qualifier. I go every year, and I, I'm pretty good at qualifying school. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit. I think that's illuminating for our average golfer to, to, to come in. This gets to the stat part of your career, which is, um, you know, what you told me at that time. You say, you know, John, I, what, where, this is back in the day when this might be an inside scoop for most people. Uh, but there was a time in golf when you could get to the tour school and they'd actually give you some money for carrying a bag and <laughs> playing a ball and maybe getting a glove. I don't know if it's still that case, but I think that a little of that has decreased. Um, it tends to be more towards winners. Uh, you can get equipment and that sort of stuff. But as far as getting some money endorsement, it was there at that time for a while. And you yeah. told me, hey, Johnny, if I get out there and I get in 21 events, I make four or five cuts. Here's the number I'm going to make, and this is still a pretty good gig for me. <laughs> and and you have always done pretty well at finding other places to play and supplement income from earnings. So that's kind of what you told me. And true to your form, 20 qualified schools later, you have gotten through a high percentage, probably one of the highest percentage of, for the amount of times qualified. So, but this gets to your stats, which I'm going to kind of share with you real quick. I just oh, kind of, do we have to? Or well, you know, I think we should. I think, and, you know, just looking really quick, let's just look at the Champions Tour, which I think has been kind of, you know, kind of representative of your whole career. Um, you know, your first year in 2011, you, you did hit it 200, you averaged, there wasn't that many events that you played, so you didn't get total official how you ranked among other players, but you did average 266 off the tee, almost 267 in 2011. Uh, your, uh, uh, you were 79. Five uh, seven. Um, that is uh, that was your average fairways hit, and you were sixty six point sixty six two four in greens and regulation, uh, and you were one point seven in you know greens in, in uh, putts per green. So we go to two thousand twelve. You're basically almost the same numbers again, except you've lost about nine yards off the tee, where you then stay for several years. You're 72nd in distance off the tee. You're second in fairways hit. You're 36th in greens and regulation. And, uh, and you're 32nd in putting and, and one, at, again, 1.79. And you, you average somewhere in most of your career right around three birdies around. You don't make a lot of eagles. Again, that's probably because of a distance issue. But, you know, on, on a whole, Jeff, and, you know, when you look at this six or seven years that you had a pretty good run on the Champions Tour, you were pretty, you're, you're always first or second in accuracy off the tee. You're right at 250 to 255 in average distance off the tee. And you're very consistent on the greens and regulation. Now, one thing I'd like to say about this, so you have a very consistent game, and I think that melded well with qualifying school. It didn't make any difference. How many U.S. Opens have you played in, three or four? How many I played in three. Three regular and senior yeah. U.S. Opens. You played in a few of those. I watched you play up here uh, a few years back. Yeah, you, six or seven i think 
senior yeah. opens. Yeah. So yeah. right, and and uh, how have you fared in senior U.S. Opens in making cuts? Pretty good. Average fifty fifty. Oh, I couldn't tell. I think I've made more than I've missed on the senior right. part of it. Um, don't remember any real top thing. I think Omaha one year I. I had a good final round that got me maybe around 20th or 25th or yeah. something like that. Um, it, to digress a little bit, but the stat thing, the only thing I've ever looked at is that there was a year when I believe I played the nationwide or, or corn Ferry it is now, I don't know what it was called then, but I averaged 273 off the tee. And I said, where did that 23 yards go in – you know, eight years or 10 years and mm -hmm. uh, it's all club head speed and the ability right. to move properly and uh, right. which is difficult as you get older. Yeah. I mean, and that's, so, I mean, I think the thing I want to let, let, I'm going to switch this up a minute. We're just right on the, 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 your website. And I think it's pretty powerful um, of what you kind of bring as a coach or a player with knowledge and um, it kind of leads me into a little bit of a history too, but it, I'm going to read it right out loud. It says, I've had the privilege of playing with and learning from some of the best players to have ever played the game. Through my playing experiences, I have learned a great deal about how to prepare and play in golf tournaments. I specialize in tournament preparation and in managing your game in addition to the mechanics of the golf swing. It takes a certain awareness and freedom to take your game to the course. I mean, that really is very astute on your part of what your skills really are. You, you've really learned how to manage what assets you have and apply them daily on a golf course to get maximum results. Um, where do you think you learned that? I mean, where did that come from for you, that, that ability to manage, hey, you're not the longest ball hitter. You, like you said, you're not the greatest iron player. But, I mean, this year in, uh, in, in two of the top tournaments, Southern California averaged 64.9 basically is a stroke average. And I, okay, short course or not, Jeff, I don't, I, you know, whatever. You yeah. still did it. How do you do that? Well, I think that I've always felt the strongest part of mine was my course management skills. And where do those come from? I don't know. You don't go practice yeah. them or yeah. they're just innate, I think. They're just, you, you have them or you don't. It's like somebody being good at math, you know, and you right, ask, right. how do you do all that? And I can't seem to get it, and, you know. You think it's competition early? Competition early, maybe? Learning how to maximize. Yeah. You know, yeah, I'm not a big so. kid. You're 150. You're, it says, I don't know what you weigh today, but you're 5'9", 150 most of your career. Yeah. Uh, so you, you don't come right off as a long ball hitter. No. Uh, it, but so you, you managed to score with. No, I, I think definitely that came from starting at a young age, playing a lot of golf, and hitting the ball short and learning how to compete meant I better learn to chip. I better not miss it over here or there. Or, you know, I had to do different things right. to shoot good scores than the guy that hit it 300 yards down the middle every time. Right. So I think, yeah, I learned that at a young age without even knowing what I was doing. It just sort of happened. Yeah. And, uh, then as, as I got older, you know, it, it, I, I still had that, but I just wasn't playing with much freedom in my game. And, and uh, then I met Fred Shoemaker and Fred's, Fred really helped. And then I just did a lot of reading and whatnot on my own and did, you know, this, you, you got to go out and let it go. You cannot try to guide the ball. And so now pretty much for every shot, I just say, you know, how, how, how can we let this go or how free can I be on this? Because I've convinced myself that if I try to steer it or guide it or control it, I'm going to hit a bad shot. I know that. So there's no point in trying to over control it. There's no point in trying to steer it or guide it. I know I'm going to hit it bad. So I have nothing to lose by swinging freely and letting it go. So that's pretty much what I tell myself on everything from putting chipping all the way through the bag so to just make just to trust trust what you have and, well yeah and just even, let it go. you know trust is hard too i mean if you're swinging bad or you haven't played in a while how do you trust it but you can always say well 
how would I hit this if I were hitting this ball out in the ocean or if I were hitting it into a net where I didn't, you don't steer a ball that you hit into a net because right, you're, right. you don't care where it goes. And, and it's really giving up that sort of worry about how, oh, where's it going to go? I hope it doesn't go on the lake or I hope I don't hit it out of bounds or come up short in that bunker. Or, you know, it's well, it, being it, it, able to, yeah, get those, sort of negative thoughts they're going to be there but you know but it's also you, you know would you say and this brings me to another question um you know as the game has evolved you were always good at preparing to hit a shot you you were able to get your facts straight you were able to get your numbers down so can you walk us through a little bit for the average guy what that means to you i mean you're standing there at say 213 and you've got a pin sitting on what 20 say 50 22 from the front edge and let's say it's in the right side of the green you know what you're not thinking seven iron right so you've got to negotiate a bunch of different things here I've seen you do it and you're really good at it so you, you pretty much know how far your ball is going to land and what's how it's going to play and roll out and your pattern's pretty consistent yeah. so those things you're able to manage that well your dispersion is pretty consistent call it all misses call it all makes whatever it is yeah. it's very consistent right yeah i i don't have a specific checklist that i go over like oh let's check the lie the wind i that just comes innately too to me now from yeah. playing for so many years you know right. probably the first thing i do is look at the lie that's going to dictate right what shot i'm going to hit more than what's required you know if i have a front pin and the greens are hard and I'm 110 and it's a full wedge, but I'm in a divot and I can't get it up in the air and spin it. I got to go to plan B, you know, exactly. so um, most of those things I don't even have to think about. Fortunately, you're all, right. you have to gauge all the wind and right. the air. Is it heavy? Is it cold? Is the ball carrying? Is it sea level altitude? Most of those things, Fortunately, you're, you know, dialed in the crane. Yeah, no, and, and you're honest with yourself. I think that's the one thing that I see and when I watch you play. You're very honest with yourself when you play. You, you play to what you know you can do. Yeah, yeah. I right. don't – often I'm not going to try to hit driver off out of a divot over water from right, right, right. you know. I, right. I, I know my limitations, I guess, and I right. know what I can do too. And so you know, we all that, walk that fine line between, you know, yeah, I'm going to go for it and well, maybe I shouldn't. And, you know, that's a battle that we all face right. on, you know, maybe not every shot, some shots, 150 right in the middle of the fairway, nothing around. That's easy. But yeah, over the course of a round of golf, you're going to run into some, you know, tough decisions and, Hopefully you're a good enough decision maker to pick the right the right decision and hit a good shot. Right. So so let me ask you this. So as the has has your routine one of the things I remember that was really interesting to me in watching you at tournament sites would be you were one of the few players that almost invariably would end up in a practice bunker before they played. It just seems yeah. to be a tra are you still that way? Because it yeah. was always a trademark. You would yeah. go in that practice. There would, be, I, I would, there would be the scummiest looking, you know, Long Beach open, Queen Mary open, whatever, you know, fair bunker there. You'd be over there, you know, hitting the I still do that. And I, it surprises me that more don't because usually I'm the only one in there. Oh, yeah, of course. You don't want to walk that far or something, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I would say – Part of why I played better on the Champions Tour was that uh, my preparation changed somewhat in that um, I would go out usually on a Monday or Tuesday afternoon when everybody had played their practice rounds and I'd walk around usually either by myself or with my caddy and I'd take three or four balls, just a putter and my 58 degree sand wedge, which is what I use probably 80% of the time around the green. I knew where the pins were going to be from previous years, or even if I hadn't played the course, you pretty much know they're right. using the corners of the green. And, and I just chip and putt for 10, 15, sometimes 20 minutes on each green. And then I knew where I could miss it with that pin, where, right. you know, I could wanted to putt from to this pin. And 
And then that just gave me another level of confidence that, uh, you know, I know where to hit it on this hole. And I know where, what that, you know, green does with that pin up front left. Right. And if you're long, it's an uphill putt. It's an easy birdie putt. It's, so let's make sure we're a little past the hole here. So I had, that to me was more important than playing a practice round. Because right. invariably when I would play a practice round, I'd hit a bunch of squirrely shots and I'd be walking down the fairway working on something. And I wasn't even paying attention to the golf course. Right. And I'd miss things that, that I would see when I was just walking it with my wedge and putter. Cause I'd walk from one green to the next, I'd be walking up the fairway. I'd see a lot more of the lay of the land, so to speak. And I go, Oh, cause I know where the driver it's 250. Yeah. If I miss it, it's 240. If I hit it good, it's 260. So, I mean, right. I can yeah. go out and look where that area is and say, okay, this is about where we'll be hitting it. What's the next shot look like? And I'm actually seeing things that I wouldn't see if I were playing a practice round. Right. Uh, because so my mind of- would be too much on, oh, my swing's all messed up. And, I, you know, look how bad I'm hitting it. And I got to get this – practice round over with and get to the range and find a swing before Thursday. Well, that never worked. And, and on top of not working, uh, it took my mind off the golf course and seeing what I needed to see on the golf course uh, for the tournament itself. Yeah. I mean, what I'm hearing is a theme is that over the years, you, you, you've kind of accepted what your game was but you've learned how to manage it. And part of that management was being less focused on your mechanics and being more focused on how to apply your skill sets to particular golf courses and not worrying about extraneous stuff that you really had no control over. It seems to me, I mean, am I putting words in your mouth or, but it seems to me that's kind of telling me. Pretty much. I mean, in this game, you never stop thinking your golf swing is going to get better. You can hit it better, more solid or further or higher or whatever. You'll never get rid of that. Right. I came to accept what I had, even though back my mind, yeah, I can get better. I, I, you know, work on this, but once the tournament starts, it's, you know, not trying to fix my golf swing anymore, get better with my golf swing. Here's what I have. Let's go make it work. And that's what I did as a kid, uh, hitting it short and, you know, right. saying to myself, well, how do I, how do I win this tournament? I don't make par here. How do I get this up and down? And, and then working with Ernie for four or five years and, and longer, I really struggled with my swing, but you know, I had a high school golf team to make. I had junior tournaments I still had to play in and, you know, right. as well as anybody, you're out there trying to fix your swing and play in a tournament. Right, right, right. The result isn't usually too good. But, you know, I had to figure out a way to – and I started just hitting punch shots and low fades and high hooks, and I'd do anything to get the ball up towards the green and in the hole, you know. Yeah, and I got a quick, and quick sculling Q&A. I'd do it. I have a quick Q&A with you. So um, you've talked about physical – this and not getting club at speed. Have you tried? Have you tried anything to pick up speed physically with training? And oh, yeah, sure. I've I've done yoga and worked with physical trainers and therapists and and got, had a you know a little bit of success uh, yes. with with a lot of them. There's a group down here called Paradigm uh, Paradigm Physical Training and and they're good. Mike Bentley and, and his staff. Yeah are awesome. They had me swing in the club faster, but I've just got a lot of arthritic pain in my sort of back and hips. And, and I just had to stop. I just couldn't go on anymore. It was, uh, and it's still there and, and I wish it were gone, but I haven't found anybody that's got a cure for arthritis yet. When, when you do let me know and I'll okay. uh, All right. first to call him or her, but, uh, it, yeah, it's just, you know, old age stuff, John, that's crept in. And, and yeah, I do a lot of stretching, a lot of yoga, a lot of mobility stuff. But 
uh, as I've gotten older, the energy to go do all that stuff isn't what it once was. And, and even to go practice, I love to practice, but the energy and the desire at almost 60 years old isn't what it was when I was 30, you know, and, That's, uh, yeah, I wish it were, I wish it were, but it's not. And, and yeah, you're, who isn't trying to improve their of course, life? Yeah. It, it's oh. sort of, it's sort of our nature and that we've been doing yeah. it since we were yeah, kids. Right? It's human nature. So, well, okay. Now I got a few fun questions. Yeah. Uh, we gotta get some to the yeah. We got, so your favorite golf course still, is it still, Cypress, Cypress Point. Yeah. Okay. Although uh, Sunningdale in London is a close second now. British Senior Open, what do you think? British Senior Open, love the course. It's kind of like a Cypress Point. Like and That's where it is this year, correct? You think they're going to play? It is this year if they play, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I saw that coming up. Um, that would be a fun, uh, pretty yeah. good, pretty good event to qualify, one day qualifier. That's, that's sure. kind of rare these days. <laughs> it is, uh, yeah. um, so your favorite book still, is it still uh, written as it is? Have you changed on that one? Is it still Orwell? You said <laughs> 1984 at one point. Have you got a new well, book? I wouldn't say it's my favorite. It's probably the only book I've ever read. Maybe. I love it. All right. From start to finish. Good for you. Yeah, well, in high uh, school anyway. Was that, was it insisted upon or was it optional? Well, on the, on the reading. Uh, it was required reading. Required reading. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and is your what's your favorite hamburger? Is it still Tommy, or would oh, you go yeah, with Tommy's it now? All the way. Yeah, we've got Tommy's, one in okay. San Diego now, so uh, that's a good thing. They moved down there for you. Yeah, they were all over LA. Okay. Double cheese, um, extra chili. Okay. Um, have you learned how to play the drum during this pandemic? I mean, what have you I done? I have Jeff? not. In fact, I had a set of drums, and they sat in the box for three, four years, and I finally got rid of them. And who's your favorite drummer? Is it, was it? Well, it'd be it either Barrymore Barlow, Keith Moon, John Bonham. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, Barrymore is the only one still alive, but I don't know what he's doing anymore. If he's drumming or. The, you know, the, the paper the and I read every time I see one of my rock star heroes turn 75, I go, oh my gosh, what's going on here? <laughs> I know. I know. So, it was cool uh, to see the Stones the other night. You know, there, who was the drummer for, was it Keith, was it Moon, for, for Pink Floyd? Was it Keith Moon? No, no, that Moon. Who's the drummer for Pink Floyd? Uh, I should know that. Yeah, yeah I should know it too, but he was yeah, being inducted to Waters and uh, yeah. David Gilmore. Yeah. The, yeah. That, uh, I should know the Nick Mason right? or was it Nick Mason? On yeah, Brooklyn? I think it was Nick Mason. Good call. He was being inducted into the European Rock Hall of Fame, and, and uh, they said, "Well, is there anything you'd like to say?" He says, "You know, I uh, my mom uh, asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I told her I wanted to be a drummer in a rock and roll band." And she goes, "Great, then you never have to grow up." <laughs> It's all our childhood dreams are like that too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So Jethro Tull. Now, your favorite group of all time? Um, mm -hmm. Which which album? Aqualung or uh, Thick as a Brick? Well, Thick as a Brick would be my favorite, and uh, I'd probably put Passion Play and Aqualung a uh, two right A there. and two B. I think. How uh, many concerts? Tall concerts, Mr. Anderson. Well, would you say? I never counted them, not as many as some think, but probably 40, you know, give or take a few. That's a few. That's a few. You know, keep uh, in mind, they've been around 50 years and the first 10, I wasn't old enough to go see them. So. True, true. Yeah, he uh, recorded his first, first thing at 68. I've seen them every U.S. tour and sometimes two or three times on that, on the same tour, so. I'd say 40s probably fairly accurate. Interesting fun fact about Ian Anderson. What's uh, what's uh, anything that that that? Well, I, he's known as a flute player, of course. But yes. in my opinion, he's a great acoustic guitarist. In fact, he plays all kinds of instruments. Yeah, he does. I think he's a better acoustic guitarist than he is flautist. So uh, yeah, he, he started also, out as a guitarist. I think you're, you might be referring to his. Uh, Salmon farm that he owns. Yeah, salmon farms, and he's also a one-legged flute player. He's been he's been called uh, the deranged yeah, flamingo. Yeah. <laughs> so, but he, he's a great performer, and still performing yeah. these days. And hope to we'll, we get to see him again. He was. I think he just. Yeah, did, I just saw him uh, last year. Uh, San Diego. Yeah. On the road. 
Dom last year at the, I think it was a Civic Theater in San Diego. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, if you, 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 your other goal was maybe to bulldoze uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. I, I saw that written somewhere and play golf with the Dalai Lama. Those were all Which, tongue in cheek, John. Those are all, gosh. Would you like to play with the Dalai Lama at Cypress Swim in the La Brea Tar Pits. Yeah, be... and swim in the La Brea Tar Pits. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. For those that don't know the La Brea Tar Pits, that's... Uh, are they still there, by the way? Yeah, they're still there. They're, that, mm -hmm. That's where they dig a lot of dinosaurs out down yeah. on Wilshire Boulevard or near, near Wilshire Boulevard in Los yeah. Angeles. Yeah. Uh, it's where the Natural Museum of History is in LA, and they still produce bones out of that tar, out, of that, out of that tar pit. Down yeah, there. I watch them do it. I don't know if I've ever been there, but if I did, it was a long time ago. That was a school trip. If you were uh, as a little kid, they used to drag us there on school trips. Yeah. But Jeff, this has been a pleasure and illuminating, and I hope uh, you know. Again, congratulations on a great last year in, in the section in Southern California. Hope you get the opportunity to play again. I'm considering making a little appearance at the Long Beach Open. It would be hey, that, that'll 43 work. years apart from the first time I entered as an amateur in 77. Wow. So, yeah, so that would be know. kind of interesting. I'm sure they'll have a big party uh, that they'll throw for you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just cash the check immediately. Commemorate your 43rd anniversary. Right, here's your story. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Well, hey, I look forward to seeing you there, and uh, yeah, I look forward for to having me. Yeah, Jeff, thanks again. Thanks for your time. Right, Appreciate good, it. Take good, care, buddy. Being with you. Take yeah, care. Yeah, bye bye. All right. Really don't mind if you sit this one out. My words but a whisper, your deafness, a shout I may make you feel, but I can't make you think Your sperm's in the gutter, your love's in the sink So you ride yourself over the fields And you make all your animals Thick as a brick And the sand castle virtues Are all swept away In the tidal destruction The moral malaise The elastic retreat Rings the clothes of play The last wave uncovers the new vangled way. But your new shoes are worn at the heels, and your suntan was rapidly peeled. And your wise men don't know how it feels to be thick as a brick.